Okay, welcome everyone. So let's continue with the second session of the, the symposium. So I'm Carlos Segura, I'm part of the research group, and uh, me and Jordi and Joan Serra will be the chairs of this session. Here we'll have four great uh, works, mainly from Interspeech and, and um, ICASP. And well, our first speaker is, uh, is Miguel, uh, Miguel India, from is a student at the UPC, and he also uh, is also a research engineer at Verdio. And he is going to present uh, search multi head attention for speaker verification. Um, okay, hi, um, good morning. Um, first, um, um, thanks for the organizers and um, for this event. So it's great to be able to share our work um, with some people of. Um, our field, also with people that is not from our field, and maybe with some people that is just get, getting started in, in deep learning. So let's start. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the motivation of this work is obtaining utterance level speaker representation. So uh, in a speaker verification, we are working um, very hard in extracting very discriminative speaker embeddings. So here in the in the right image, you have a scheme of what is the more like more the standard architecture of a speaker classifier trained to obtain speaker embedding. So normally we work um, as inputs like MEL spectrogram, um, K-extreme features, or any kind of filter ramps. So at the end, at the input of the network, we have a segment of features. And then normally, in this architecture, we have a DNN encoder, a pooling algorithm, and a set of fully connectors with a softmax layer. Or if maybe um, you can also train this network with, I don't know, with some kind of control series loss, triple loss, et cetera. So, <coughs> so um, current state of the art encoders right now in speaker verification are based on one dimension convolutional neural network or two dimension convolutional ne neural network. So um, the output of these networks are typically um, a sequence of feature embeddings. So we have a DNA encoder, which input is a sequence of acoustic features, and we, what we ob um, obtain as output is a sequence of um, speaker embeddings. And then we need like a pooling method or a pooling algorithm that is able to map um, these short, um, short utterance or frame level features into a unique representation. So mm, there are several st statistical approaches um, that were proposed, like temporal pooling or statistical pooling. So for example, and temporal pooling is only doing the average of this sequence of features. And statistical pooling, for example, is extracting the mean and the standard deviation or other higher statistics stats from the sequence and use these statistics as a vector and input again and other fully connected in order to obtain a, a trans level speaker embedding. <coughs> so um, in 2018 Interspeech, um, they proposed the first um, self attention pooling layer um, by Yu um, Ying. So they, the idea is to obtain an utterance level representation as a weighted average of the frame level features. So here you have the, the skin as what is a self-attention pooling. So at, at the bottom of the autumn, you have the sequence of features of the encoded. And you just use a normal attention model, which obtains the, the weight for each of these um, feature segments. And you just um, do a a smart average, um, a weighted average with the words extracted from the attention model. As you see, um, we use a very simple attention mechanism. So it's just like a softmax layer with no bias. <coughs> and the idea is that, that the, um, the alignment created by this attention model um, attends to the most discriminative um, regions of the encoded sequence. At the same time, normally, this also can be used as speech activity detector, because normally this attention also is able to distinguish in between speech or non-speech frames. So these attention have mainly two disadvantages. The first one is that attention works over the wall space of the encoded representations. And the, two, and the second disadvantage is that attention is limited to attend a few regions of the segment. Not in theory, 
But in practice, the, what happens is that I'm um, attention just point like one or two only regions of the subspace. So, <clears throat> what we propose in this work is making a self multi head attention pooling, also called multi head self attention, it depends. Um, the, what we do in, in multi head attention pooling is that we split um, the, the encoder representations or the hidden states of the encoder into different heads. So then, and we compute a different attention for each head, and we extract a context vector for each one of these heads. And at the end, the utterance level representation is the concatenation of the context vectors of each one of these heads. So in comparison with the previous um, um, approach, there are, we have three advantages. The first one that, that is, the first one is that each head is able to capture a different subset of features. At the same time, um, one great thing that happens is that each head can be matched with a set of encoder CNN output channels. So if you have a CNN that has, um, for example, 512 channel, and you want, for example, um, you can match the heads like, okay, so each head um, matches with four channels of the CNN. So the first um, head is matched with the, the fourth the first fourth of put channels, the second one um, from the five, from the fifth to the eight, etc. And the second advantage is that we are able to attend more regions over the encoded um, subspace. So we have more attention, we have more capacity to attend over different regions, and at the same time, if we, can, we are capturing different subset of features, each attention is, um, has more flexibility to attend different regions of that segment. And the advantage three is the can number does not affect the number of trainable parameters. So at the end, you are splitting the vector in a defined number of, um, of heads. So you can add more, st um, st more um, capacity of, um, in, the, in the network to attend different subsets, but you are not adding more parameters in the, in the network. So um, in our experiments, what we want is to analyze the improvement of self multi head pooling attention layer. Um, and for this, what we did is um, we have fixed a architecture, a standard architecture, and then we have trained um, this speaker classifier with different kinds of um, pooling algorithms. So, and the idea is to train this network as a speaker classifier, and then use one of the last and fully connected layers as a speaker embedding. Then these embeddings are evaluated at cosine distance in a standard evaluation data set for speaker verification. So what we want in, in a speaker verification is to determine um, if two speech signals and belongs to the same speaker or to a different speaker. So what we did is to extract um, one speaker embedding per audio, and then we apply a distance to get a score. And this score indicates if, okay, the score is high, and um, it belongs to um, the two audios and belongs to the same speaker. If it's low, for example, it's, it means that um, it belongs to different speakers. So additionally, what we also wanted is to analyze the alignments created by the proposed attention mechanism. So in your right, you have the, the scheme of the, of the network that we have used. Um, it's a BGG-based encoder. Um, it's something different. We have adapted a, a bit for the task. And after the basic, the basic encoder, we have the pooling layer. And then we have two fully connected layers. And, the, and we use the last layer previous to the self layer as the speaker embedding. Um, so we have evaluated this approach on the box cell of one data set. So this is um, for audio is like an um, intermediate size data set. So it contains like. Um, one th um, 100,000 utterances for 1,251 um, celebrities. Um, we have considered three pooling methods to compare against um, the proposed method, temporal pooling, statistical pooling, and self-attention pooling, which is uh, um, the same than considering multi-head attention with only one head. And additionally, we have considered a vector plus, plus PLDA as a global system baseline that is a very used method for speaker verification that we are always considering for, for these evaluations. And the idea is that the, the metrics that we're using is equal error rate and detection cost function. So the idea is less error is better in this case. Okay, so here you have the results. You have a table with, the, with both the CFF and equal error rate. And at, in the right, you have the, the dead curve. 
So the best multi-head pooling result is achieved with 64 heads. This corresponds to eight channels per head. Um, in the results, we see that self-attention pooling layer is better, but it's still very close to um, both statistical and temporal pooling. And of course, self multi head pooling layer outperforms the other visual methods. If not, we are, I wouldn't be here presenting this, this work. Uh, and besides, um, I'm going to do uh, an alignment analysis. Okay. So in the top, you have, um, we have the analysis of the weight values for the first six multi head attentions over at utterance. Okay, this is analysis is done over the the index of the of the encoder. So it goes from zero to thirty six. That it's that this is more or less. Uh, for example, this will be uh, this will be like a four hand um, four second audio. For example, um, I have not plotted uh, more 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 heads because then it's not possible to to see what happens. And in the bottom image, what we have is a comparison between vanilla tension weights, so um, k equal to one head, and the average weight over all the heads of the multi-heat. So we have overaged all the heats, and then we have get that that alignment that is the, the cumulative, that it's called here, cumulative multi-head attention. So the idea is that multi-head pooling um, allow us to capture um, subsets of features from the coding representations in the different parts of the signal. As you see, each one of these heads is, um, is pointing in a different region of the encoded representations <coughs> of the CNN. And multi-head pooling at the same time is able to attend regions of the sequence where vanilla tension is not able to detect discriminative features. For example, if you see in the, in the bottom image, um, there are um, some points that the that this red line is having a peak, and for example, and the vanilla tension is not pointing. Okay, so what are heads encoding? The idea is um, heads encoding um, foreign information. Here you have a a picture that with the matching of some words and with the alignment. And the idea is that um, each head attends different regions of the sequence. And there is a relation between the number of attention peaks and the number of heads. Um, if you have more, uh, more, attention, more attention heads, you have less peaks. And however, we still have not been able to find clear patterns in, in these alignments. So this is our current future work, improving the self-attention mechanism, analyzing the performance of these layers, and find a better imp imp interpretation of the attention alignments, which is clear correlations between phonemes and its head alignment. Analyze how the behaviors of this attention depends on the number of heads used. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Michael, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, let's see if the audience has some questions for, for him. Hi. Yeah, I was wondering if you know how that compares to X vectors, for instance, like more recent um, techniques. Mm. So, I, so I wonder if it's fair to compare that to iVector, which is like somewhat outdated. Yeah, well, the thing is that X vector is not just the, for me, it's not just the network itself, like in classes that, that kind of TDNN. So X vector is just um, a set of things that Brenner University have going ber very well, like the, for example, the TDNNs, mm -hmm. the statistical pooling, um, some kind of backend that, that they are using and some kind of data set normalization. Um, in fact, in here what we are comparing is the, is the pooling layer, which okay. in, case, in the case of X vector, it's the statistical pooling. Okay. Um, the idea is that um, X, um, in X vectors, the people of Reno um, did the first self-attention pooling layer, so they proposed that step, and then we're improving that, okay. that step. So. Any more questions? Okay, then let's thank our presenter again. Okay, thank you. So the next presentation is going to be by Alp Oktem. Uh, he 
He got his PhD recently this year, and he's the co-founder of Collectivat. And he's going to present a prosodic phrase alignment for machine dubbing. Is this working? Yes. We all see the same thing. Cool. So hello everyone, I'm Alp. Um, thanks for having me here, first of all. Thanks for the organizers and the sponsors to make this great event possible. I'm going to present the paper Prosthetic Phrase Alignment for Machine Dubbing, which was published in Interspeech, this year's Interspeech. It's kind of a spin-off, partially related, and kind of like a future project, hopefully, uh, of my thesis work that I carried out uh, with the help of my co-supervisors Mireya Farrus and Antonio Bonafonte, which are also co-authors of the paper. So the domain we're working on is audiovisual translation and ways to automate that. This is actually super relevant in today's context uh, with the ocean of content constantly pouring into the internet like in sites like YouTube. For example, with the push of a button, um, you can use a bunch of tools that kind of translate uh, the content that you're seeing into the language, into your language, if it's supported by Google. Um, this, of course, amplifies your content automatically to the speakers of other language. And, however, there's this other type of audiovisual translation that we're all familiar with, but not in the uh, in the domain of the of the uh, user generated content and it's called dubbing this is uh, actually replacing the spoken segments um, in, a, in an audiovisual with um, with with dialogues that are translated and for example recorded in a studio environment um, this is kind of like a, a, as a type of translation culturally preferred depending on the country um, but more than that, it's also a much more accessible uh, method for children and for viewers with reading these capacities. But of course, it's, uh, we don't see this yet in like automatized um, in sites like YouTube, for example. Well, as you might guess, because it involves much more complexities. Once you introduce the visual and audio domain, there comes this um, issue of alignment. For example, one of the major things, not all, that is taken care of in dubbing is lip syncing, lip synchronization. So the audios are recorded in a way that they have to match how the, the on-screen character's lips are moving, right? So among the things that lip syncing takes care of, in our paper, we only focused on how to achieve a similar phrasing and pausing structure as uh, we see in the video. So if it's not clear, don't worry, I will demonstrate that with an example. This is an ex um, excerpt from the TV series Heroes, part of our Heroes Corpus. That's a shame. You've done so much for us. We've done so much for you. So much that we couldn't do for you anymore if you were to leave. So. If you have noticed, there's like this way of phrasing the sentence, right? So if we were to dub the segment, be it prof uh, professionally or in, a, um, in, a, in an automatic way, we have to follow this rough pipeline, which I'm not going to go into more detail, as we did in the paper, that first we need to recognize the content. If we don't have the script, recognize the script. But more than that, uh, we have to recognize also the way he speaks how he phrases, where he pauses, and so on. We could translate this. Um, for example, this is the output of uh, the, the machine translation system we trained. Not perfect, but OK. And 
obviously we should be synthesizing this, right? But we should be synthesizing this in a way that kind of like respects the way he phrases, because in the pauses that he makes in his speech, obviously his lips are not moving, so it would be not really realistic to hear any synthesis at these exact periods. So I will follow um, this pipeline in more detail um, right now um, in the rest of my presentation. So first comes the recognition part. So if you have the question mark, we already have the scripts coming from the subtitles. What we want to recognize is the phrasing structure. We called it prosodic phrasing because um, because it's like the groupings of the of the words and the pauses, pauses are involved. Uh, we define it by um, a pause terminated subphrase, so which is um, detectable if we have the word boundary information. Um, in our case, we we chose 250 milliseconds as a boundary for for a prosodic phrase. All right. So once you analyze the speech sample uh, this way, you end up with a, um, with a prosodic phrase structure where we know um, how each segment, how long they take, and the, pause, and the length of the pauses in between. So this kind of will hint us and later on how, where are we going to put our synthesis. Um, the next comes translation, which is straightforward. Train a, it's a high resource language, Spanish and English. Um, get the translation. However, now the problem comes how to align this to how to how to partition this translation into into kind of like um, into groupings that kind of make sense, right? So this calls for um, sort of an alignment, which um, which is kind of like uh, incorporated in neural machine translation through a mechanism called attention which is used to learn uh, parts, like relevant parts between the source and the target phrase. So in training, this makes better tr a translation, obviously. But during inference, when we're using the machine, we can actually reach this information. And just by looking at it, we can kind of like trace um, how, each, um, how each group in the input sentence kind of align to the words that we have. So it's to make this connection. Of course, to make this automatically, um, this is the, um, the methodology that we followed. So in the beginning, we, have, uh, uh, we know the source sentence and we know its phrasing. We have the target sentence, but just the words. We first populate all possible groupings of the target sentence. Through these um, groupings, we want to choose the most optimal one, right? So we use the attention weights that were output during the translation of that segment and using um, not a so complicated functions that involves masking of the attention matrix according to the label alignments and then a summon product that um, sums these up and decides on a score for that particular alignment. And at the end, what you will end up with, a list of scores for all the possible um, groupings where you will, I mean, we just base, uh, choose the best scoring one and decide on that, on how to align all the words that we have. So now it's actually, we are closing up to the, to the last step. We know our time constraints. We know which words to align with which words. Now it's time to synthesize. So the method we follow for that is what we call as synthesis bending. Uh, which is pretty simple. We either stretch the time, phoneme timings or, or shrink them in order to fit the, the timings that, that, is, um, that is conditioned by the source sentence. So I'll jump to how it sounds because that's fun, no? Um, I'll ask you to not to give attention to, to the synthesis, especially the TTS researchers. This is a super old TTS system, but our aim is, of course, to, to make the lip, uh, lip syncing, right? Has hecho mucho por nosotros. Hemos hecho mucho por ti. Tanto que no podíamos hacer para ti, si te vas a abandonar. So if you like that, there's more of them in the GitHub repository. Um, um, 
so let's be a bit more scientific now. We did some analysis, but I have to say we have to also come out with ways how to analyze this, okay? Um, so we decided to compare this to, um, to professional dubbing. The thing we wanted to compare is like how do the speech rates com combine? First, we analyzed professionally dubbed segments in our corpus, um, and we found that for each syllable in English, there was 1.3 syllables in Spanish, and we saw that through our phrase alignment algorithm, we were actually able to get close to this by um, the speech, speech, ratio, speech rate ratio was 1.27, so a super close figure. But of course, this is an average number, beware, because, I mean, as you see in the hat, shaped figure um, oops. that of course there are outliers and this means that some segments were either stretched out too much or shrink too much that kind of like sounded really unnatural and yes we saw also like uh, segments were more likely to, to be um, sped up than slowed down um, which kind of um, yeah like Spanish sounds much more faster actually um, and it shows in our both in our data and in our translations. So um, to sum up all this, what did we achieve? We, um, to our knowledge, we're one of the first that um, dealt with the issue of visual syncing in an audiovisual translation setting. Um, we focused on the problem of lip syncing um, on the basis of speech activation. Um, so of course. Um, we proved that uh, the attention mechanism is useful in this sense, and we were able to obtain a similar speech rate ratio to professional dubbing. Um, next steps, hopefully, is that like um, lip syncing doesn't all just involve that, um, speech activation linking, um, like opening and closing mouth movements of the mouth. These could be also incorporated in the scoring mechanism. And much more beyond that, there's much more that involves with dubbing, like mm, we would like the, the, the synthesis to sound like the guy we're seeing, uh, the character we're seeing. And also in the sense of prosody, um, of course there's much more than phrasing to, to transfer in a in a in a language to language setting. So thank you. Um, you can read the paper with a perception test and there's some uh, more information there. If you're bored of scientific papers, you can check the blog that I recently uh, wrote with a lot of samples and so on. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Hal, for presenting this great work. Uh, do you have some questions uh, for him? Thanks for the nice presentation. So I, I'm from a computer vision background, and I should ask, like, do you think that visual cues would help in this task, or it's really not necessary for based on your experience? I mean, uh, I don't think if you just want to match lip syncing for me, it's obvious. Like, what you hear, the the, the speech audio is directly related with the lip movements. Um, it could maybe help, but really, in my perspective, as, as I work in, I mean, I, I'm a speech and NLP researcher, I don't see the point yet to, to go any way to the visual. But really, if you see anything, there's, um, I would like to discuss. Well, I, I mean, was just wondering, I, I understand that at some point you make a translation, and I understand that there are might be multiple ways to translate some statement, and maybe uh, looking at the pixels, uh, might help you in conditioning mm -hmm. a translation that put better later match synthesis. Maybe it's a mm -hmm. bit too much because the other option is just to change them. Okay, I think it's just, but just change the pixels. But I think they are interesting venues in this direction. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. Are there more questions for him? So if not, let's uh, thank our presenter Order. again. Yes, ah, a question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think it's... <laughs> Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, with respect to the uh, phrase alignment step, what happens when you don't get a one-to-one -one alignment? For instance, one to three. Um, short answer, you do your best. Because it always, 
I mean, there are possible alignments and you score them according to, so the attention matrix only, um, if there's a weight in the attention matrix, it, put, it pushes that alignment up. So if all of them are not really aligning well, um, then, then you will have like low scores in general, but re again, from them, you will choose the best one anyway. So there were no case actually that, that involved a misalignment. It was sometimes like if, if the translation failed and output just like yes uh, for a long sentence, of course you couldn't find five groupings in one word. That was the only problem. Um, but yeah, if there are enough words to align to the source, then you will just go with the best one. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Now let's thank our speaker. <laughs> Presentation by Santi Pascual, uh, who's he's currently a, a PhD student at the UPC, and he will present a Latin program agnostic speech representation from multiple self supervised tasks. Thank Come you. On. So I'm here to, pre to present our joint work with Mila People, Mirko Ravanelli, and Joshua Benjo, and my co advisors for my thesis. So this work is about a twofold reason, is proposing a encoder for speech and the way to train it self-supervisedly. We'll see what self-supervised means. So let me first motivate this, like what do we want out of this work? Well, we want a generalizable speech encoder that we inject waveforms to it and we get speech embeddings, let's call, um, and those are suitable to be injected into different tasks that require speech as input. Namely, it could be speech recognition, speaker recognition, and so on. But we don't know which those tasks are. We don't know them yet. But we want to train an encoder like this, and we want to extract useful features for those future tasks. So there's a disconnection here. So how should we train this? We want it, but we want to train it somehow to avoid knowing those tasks. So this is the twofold proposal. First, the problem agnostic speech encoder itself. And secondly, the framework to train it based on su self-supervised learning named multi-worker learning, okay? So what is self-supervised learning? Um, let me find self-supervised learning as um, that type of learning where the network, the system, is learning from the input itself, but in transformed versions of it. So if we have the X input, okay, no pointer here, X input, we can use some feature extractor to extract the Y label. And then the encoder is trying to learn to map its outputs into those labels. So this could be like making FFTs of our speech and using those FFT frames to learn, just to make this mapping, okay? As weird as it may sound for now. Other um, objectives might be suitable to not just transform speech into intermediate representations, but also to relate speech segments and learn about context, like in NLP. So similar to what word to back does, we could sample random speech windows and say, are they sampled from the same uterines or not? This is a binary classification task where the same encoder is encoding both branches of the two frames, the two windows, yeah, frames, and then a simple classifier in the end says, yes, they are neighbors or not. But the same structure is shared, so red and orange there would be the same encoder. So it's learning to encode both branches. Now, our proposal of encoder, what we named the problem agnostic speech encoder, is a fully convolutional structure that basically is emulating our classical sliding window feature extractors, yeah, but in a learnable approach with the plenty of non-linearities that our good neural networks know and, and, and can solve. So we designed this framework as a pretty much specialized front-end for speech. So we are injecting prior knowledge, something that in the end-to-end -end designs we forget sometimes. Here we inject it back and we try to mimic the STFT processing pipelines. So what we have is one frame per slide of the window, so one, two, three, up till the last frame, with some overlap. So this would be a suitable replacement to, in your classical speech processing pipelines, you could uh, hopefully get the pre-trained encoder, inject it, and see how it performs to do your recognition or conversion or whatever. So, What's the worker learning? How is it coupled on top of this encoder? The worker learning is about making a 
multi-learning, multi-task setup of different simplistic workers that we will also call minions for obvious reasons. They are just minions, simple workers doing some specific simple task. And the encoder is the one like managing to build a powerful thing. So what we have is that the same input, these frames coming out of the encoder are shared uh, by all the minions and they predict simple tasks like recover the waveform, the input waveform like an autoencoder, the log power spectrum and so on. I'll go into the details of each worker now. But the sum of these worker losses, so predicting all these simplistic sub-supervision signals, all the summation of it is building some regularized space there that knows about speech structure at different levels. Because it reconstructs from the lowest level, the waveform, till some intermediate features that we know they are meaningful to describe speech, like MFCCs, till contextualization of speech frames or sequentiality cues by the last workers we will see. But all these levels of representation are making an optimization in the output of the encoder to take into account all these features are important. So prior knowledge again in the output now, not only the structure, fully convolutional input, but also in what do you have to know about speech. So the workers themselves are in the end, the waveform reconstruction, as I said, L1 regression, log power spectrum, male frequency capsule coefficients and prosodic clues like pH and energy and so on, these acoustic contours, all these three are L2 regressions. And then we have three classifiers that try to contextualize the speech data. The first one was a bit of a spoiler in the, in the self-supervised presentation, but what it does is basically out of the current window context, the green one, we sample from a uterus, the current context, we sample randomly a neighbor context, so another window of speech, and frame by frame we match those with a classifier that's basically getting the pair of frames and saying these are one, these classifiers one, they, they, they are from the same context. Whereas if we sample the context window from a random uterus, another one, they are not neighbors, then they're classified as zero. The pair green red would be zero, the pair green blue would be one, basically. Now, the global Infomax, which is the next classifier, is taking a broader context, basically getting the average of a uterine's frames, and then for that, it's saying this is the same uterine, or this is a different uterine, basically. And finally, we have the sequential predictive code, and this worker is trying to impose what the architecture is missing by design, which is the sequentiality notion. So as it doesn't have any recurrent connection for efficiency purposes, what we do is we build some notion of uh, future and past correspondence with respect to the middle frames by saying, if I concatenate the middle, the anchor frame we call, with uh, some future frames, then it's one. With past, it's zero. Okay, binary classification, that's basically relating the context in a sequential manner. You predict whether you have past or future in your comparison. This way, some signals are there about causality, sequentiality, etc., but still no recurrence. So now, what are the workers? What's the design of the workers? And we know we have a myriad of possibilities to make neural networks, and specifically to make them work well and f have super good predictions in our regressions or classifications. But how good do we want to be in these tasks? How good do I want it to predict the log power spectrum, for example? Well, I don't want it to be a terrific prediction system, I want it just to get some signals to the encoder. And so we have to keep it simple because if the regressor or classifier is too clever, the representation doesn't have to be. So as we want a must in the representation to be clever and good and broad and take into account different factors, these systems are just multi-layer perceptrons, simple one hidden layer um, classifiers or regressors. In the case of the waveform reconstruction, of course, there are some interpolation layers with deconvolutions, but that's the, the most uh, different thing that's even not that complicated, okay? So we keep them simple so that the representation is the complex thing. And now, how do we evaluate this? We've built an encoder and we propose some way to train it, but with some self-supervised signals that might be non-related to some end supervised tasks. We want to know how good this transfers to those possible tasks. So we train it with some Liberty Speech data, with 10 hours of Liberty Speech, 12 seconds roughly per 2,500 speakers approximately. And out of this self-supervision now, we take three, uh, four different data sets Okay, we take three different tasks and we will evaluate in four different data sets, okay? These tasks, why? We because we want to demonstrate that it also transfers the features to different acoustic conditions, acoustic speakers, so acoustic, so acoustic identities by the different speakers and so on. Things that were not seen in Libre Speech. 
It's not useful to have something exportable just within libre speech, so we explore outside of libre speech. And so we evaluate three dimensions of results. First, we explore what's the importance of the workers. Are all of them important? You may ask at this point. That's a very good question to ask. Then secondly, um, we want to know how good this representation is with respect to other available representations, MFCCs, filter banks, etc. And finally, we'll see how this transfers to potentially noisy conditions, something that was not seen during self-supervision. So first, about ablation, this is just about training a paste version with all workers active and then train each version with eliminating one worker at a time. So we'll have one paste version per iteration like this all active and just one deleted at a time. And so we have a table like this, where the first, the top row of results is basically the accuracy obtained in all these data sets for these tasks. And each row is subtracting one of the tasks, so minus the waveform, minus LPS, so on. We can see basically as a quick conclusion that every time you subtract a worker, you lose something across the different tasks, unless at most you don't lose a thing. But it's not uh, something that improves removing a worker either. So the orange squares are saying, yeah, you didn't lose a thing, but you didn't gain either. Okay, so all workers remain there. Maybe even adding some workers more, maybe that's even uh, better, something to explore. Then the second sort of results are about comparing pace with different versions of usage of itself and classic features. Classic features are MFCCs and filter banks with derivatives and so on, more details in the paper. But importantly, the different pace, feet, the p different pace configurations are pace supervised, which is just end-to-end -end training without any self-supervision as a typical classifier or regressor or whatever. Then pace frozen is using it as a plain feature extractor and just training the thing on top of it. And pace fine-tune is having the self-supervision and then fine-tuning it all. And that's, of course, by far the thing that wins across tasks across data sets, across classifiers, either RNN or MLP. And finally, we also explored how the PACE features could help in distant speech recognition, not just closed speech recognition and clean data like TIMID, uh, but also in the DITA corpus, which it, but was made by the co-author Mirko Ravanelli. And he made the experiments in checking how this, uh, this, um, we could export PACE from the clean conditions of libre speech into the noisy conditions and distant and reverberant conditions basically of data corpus to make uh, speech recognition. And so we can see that by far we also can uh, surpass the performance of MFCC and filter bank features, but also, and interestingly, the best configuration is that that always contains the self-supervised features pre-trained, maybe because it gives robustness to train to pre-train on the clean conditions and build some conceptual concepts on the high level of abstractions of the network and then export them into the noisy conditions where noise that is present in the data can be ignored, could be. So to conclude, we've seen a multitask self-supervised approach that learns speech representations, an effective and exportable speech encoder that converts speech waveforms into latent embeddings, and the learned embeddings carry useful speech information related at least to speaker identity, phoneme identity, and emotional cues. And then embeddings also show their potential for transferability to new data sets, tasks, and acoustic conditions. And just for you to know, code and the models, pre-trained models and so on, it's all available on GitHub. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Santi, for this great uh, presentation. We have time for maybe one, two questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation and awesome work. I just wanted to ask if you want to compare with a different self-supervised pre-training like with CPC, with contrastive predictive coding. Yes, very good question. So yes, it's in the aim of what we're developing now, honestly, and pays um, in latest research, that's what we're doing, and compared to all the competitive embeddings in speaker ID like X vectors and so on. Yes, yes, it's in the line of research of what we're doing now. Because now PACE was even improved. It's called PACE Plus in the next generation. It will be in archive soon. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for like pointing this. Um, hi, Sandy. Thanks for the, for the talk. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so you have uh, seven different tasks, yes. like self-supervised tasks, yes. with like L1 and L2 regression, binary cross-entropy. Did you need to do any weighting for the different tasks? 
for the you know potentially different uh, ranges of the losses and gradients? So as this was proposed by many people and commented from the very first version that it's just a simplistic loss, a summation of losses, sorry. Yes, we tried to wait some time. But when we did to like equilibrate, let's say, validation loss magnitudes, what happened is that the learning was detrim detrimental because we were scaling down the most important losses. And scaling the losses, I can tell, it was just making it learn worse and transfer worse and having less accuracy. We also tried other approaches, like more clever approaches, not just weighting summations, but also uh, some, I don't know, different optimization techniques that were, were considering most prominent directions in the grain descent and so on. Neither of those surpassed the performance of summation of plane losses, surprisingly. So, yeah, nothing got better so far. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Maybe time for a quick question. If not, we can move on to the next presentation. Thanks, uh, Santi. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And our next presenter is uh, Olga Slitsovskaya, uh, who is uh, <laughs> a PhD student in UPF and is going to present end-to-end -end sound social validation condition and non-instrument uh, labels. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Olga. Thanks a lot for the presentation, for introducing me. And I'm here glad to present uh, our work on end-to-end -end source separation conditioned on instrument labels. Um, the, there were a lot of huge, a lot of works on speech recognition, speech, speech techniques, and now I want to calm you down a little bit and let you hear some music. So to introduce the task, I would let you hear three samples of the same musical composition and ask you a very simple question, like, can you hear the difference? Uh, that's the most important part of the presentation, so please <laughs> pay attention. And here's the sample one. Let's start again. Sample one. Sample two. that most of you can hear the difference between sample three and the first two, but between the first one and the second one is much more harder because they overlap a lot and without special training or without listening in it in advance, it's, it's much more harder. And now I want, to hear, I want you to hear the actual difference between those samples. So, and can you hear the difference now? <laughs> This was the difference of the first sample with respect to the second one. Now the difference of the second sample with respect to the first one. And finally, the residue of the first mixture. Much better, no? So, still, can you say if the first one and the second one are from the same musical instrument or from the different ones? Still hard, no? And if I provide you some additional information, would it be possible? Like this? You can clearly identify that both instruments are different. Uh, just keep it in mind for a while while introducing the problem we aim to solve. And our problem is source separation. Uh, our goal is having a mixture of 
probably overlapping sources, musical sources, um, we want to estimate the, their signals, their original signals. Uh, I would like to show you some example of how it works. Let's see if I can play it. Here's the mix. One of the sources, another source. They're not playing all the time. Sometimes it's, sometimes it doesn't work at all. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, now I would like to shortly discuss the task and why it's difficult to solve. What's, what's wrong with all that? First of all, uh, we have a significant overlap in time and frequency. This is especially the case for the task, for the problem we are tackling, which is the classical music source separation, which is multiple instrument source separation. This is especially the, the problem then musical instruments play in unison or in harmony, which is always the case of classical music. And also it's harder if you have several instruments of the same family, like two instruments of string and two instruments of woods. Um, the second problem that we have is that the complexity of the task increases with number of sources. If you need, just need to separate two instruments from each other, it's easier that you, if you have a mixture of six of them or five of them. Um, and this is the, one of the key differences with the previous work. And another issue is that the common approach is the, in, the, in the community is to use time frequency representation and estimate, estimate magnitude mask ratio or binary mask and apply it to the magnitude spectrogram of the, of the mixture to obtain the separated magnitude spectrogram and then use um, phase of the original mixture or phase reconstruction algorithm to obtain the original audio. And therefore, we lose some, we lose some information, we lose phase information, and not losing the phase information and use all the information which is provided in raw audio was our primary motivation to do source separation in the waveform domain. Just having both problems in mind, and the first example that I show you, uh, we want to answer another question, like, can we use also extra information to improve separation? And therefore, our contribution here is twofold. First of all, we're tackling the complex problem of source separation, of multiple instrument source separation in time domain. And the second one is that we condition source separation model network on the instrument label. We're providing extra information, but this is weak information. So we just have one zero and one uh, label vectors, not for every time frame, but for the whole musical piece, which may be several minutes. It doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that all of them are playing at the same time, but still this, we, can this even weak information help us? And uh, now let me go to the explanation of how we do it and what do we propose? Uh, so. Here's our task again. We have a mixture and we want to estimate several sources, whatever, how many, how many they are. And um, originally, it all starts in 2016. There are a huge variety of deep learning methods, of course, to, to, op to apply for the source separation task. And it all started from encoder, de from encoder decoder architecture. Um, and originally it was all working on the spectrogram based domain in 2016. Then later on in 2017, people proposed to use uh, unit architecture with all those skip connections between encoder and decoder. And therefore you, you can modulate the decoder with the respective activation of the encoder. And later on in 2018, it has been proposed wave unit architecture, which works on wave domain with 1D convolutions. And our contribution here is to add more outputs to the wave unit. Instead of four, it's like 13. It's, it's, we're trying to estimate 13 different sources, 13 different instruments. And we condition 
the BAFE unit architecture with ground truth labels on the bottleneck of the architecture. It's multiplicative conditioning, because back then the authors weren't aware about future-wise linear modulation, but never mind. And uh, also, we only condition in this work in the bottleneck of the network in the most compressed representation, even though there are different approaches and you can condition on the encoder, on the decoder, on the all the layers of the model, which leads to overfitting. Um, we train this model with the simple mean square error loss between original mixtures and the estimated mixtures. Uh, for the instruments which are not present in this particular mixture, we use silence. So we just estimate MSE error. Uh, this trained on the Rochester multimodal Rochester dataset, which is a data set of multimodal musical performance. Uh, it's quite small and have some issues, but still uh, we choose it for the reason of use other modalities as well for our work. And in total, I will show you some results and just keep it in mind, just a disclaimer, that this was trained on 30 videos of total duration about one hour and a half. So one hour and a half of the data to obtain this kind of results. It follows the same structure as the demo video. So the mixture, estimated ground truth and the estimated source. So it's not perfect, but it works. And numerically, we did some numerical estimation with the baseline, which is informed non-negative matrix factorization model. It's informed in the way that it knows about the timber of different instruments. It has the pre-trained model of timber for each instrument and apply this as the basis function for non-negative matrix factorization. And Honestly, to our great surprise, our method outperforms in terms of source to inference ratio and source to artifact ratio. The two models here is the first one with just multiple outputs and the second one is conditioned one. Um, it's much more noticeable, the difference, if you see the, how the task is performed with respect to the number of instruments. So then the complexity increases, our model actually performs better than baseline informed non-negative matrix factorization. Next, uh, I would shortly, shortly explain about our ablation studies and speed up. As I said, we took wave unit architecture from the upper and did quite a couple of changes. We optimized for the learning rate, we optimized data loading pipeline and so on. We transfer our model, like adapt our model so it will be possible to train on Google Cloud TPUs, which gave us a lot of speed up. We also trained with different um, discretization for float 32 and for the half precision case, and we obtained like total speed up of more than 30, 35 times with respect to the original model. And okay, just a takeaway message of all of that. First of all, very complex cases of musical so music source separation can be tackled in waveform domain. Additional information from different sources, from different modalities can help. And the third one, if you see that your task is very computationally intensive, you can put a lot of efforts to optimize it and to, to have significant, significant improvement in that as well. And thanks a lot for being here, for listening to it, and I'm grateful to all, all of the listed above, especially for Jeju Deep Learning Camp. This work was done while I, I was there. Thank you. So thank you, Olga, for this uh, nice presentation. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Someone is interested to ask something. Uh, hi, thanks for the nice presentation. I was wondering on how this model will work with masking frequencies between instruments when when a frequency is masked 
by another instrument, for example? It's actually the case uh, because, well, they overlap. They overlap a lot. For example, if you have, if you have the same piece which is played by duet of vi viola and violoncello, it's much more harder to estimate. Well, the model, how it works, it it lows down the 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 loudness <laughs> for both of them. It estimates both, but kind of lowers the loudness. Okay. You can add more constraints because I mean. It was trained with mean square error. It's like the easiest way as you, uh, that you can do. You can add constraints on the silent sources. You can add constraints uh, for um, for the training itself, like uh, also STFT consistency, mixture consistency, and all that. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Are you using uh, stereo input or monoaural input? We're using mono, yeah. It's single channel source operation. So is there any more questions? So I have one quick question. So on the conditioning, you said that you use the labels, but uh, like saying which are the instruments no, that are uh, there. Do you think that it's possible to do that with uh, visual conditioning, like you, you, I don't know, with, uh, analyzing what are the video movement and what are the instruments that are in the scene? This is what we are working right now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so with this, uh, let's thank again with uh, our speaker. Thank you. And uh, with this, we conclude this session about uh, audio, speech, and music. So we have now a, a break of one hour and a half for, for lunch. Uh, it, if you want to have lunch here, you have the mall. There are a lot of nice restaurants. You have, if you want to have a quick lunch, we have a cafeteria here in the building. So anyway, see you in the, uh, 2.30 here.